and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another show for another episode of our TGT podcast. So today I'm joined by Ryan Baldy. How are you doing, mate? Are you well? Are you good? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem at all. Do you want to give the listeners a little bit of background about your new book, which has come out? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so my book is called The Dream Factory Inside the Make or Break World of Football's Academies. Um, the basic premise of it is to look at the new emerging generation of English players, a lot of whom we've seen starring at the Euros at the moment. So the likes of Mason Mount, Phil Foden, um, Bukayo Saka, of course, and... Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and all the other the young players, Trent Alexander Arnold, who's not there, Marcus Rashford, who is. Uh, look at uh, how they've been created through the academy system, but also look at the costs of of, of that of that system. So that is, is is both a financial cost and a kind of personal human cost of, of the attrition that goes on. So it's a real sort of deep dive into the academy world. I, I spent a lot of time at different academies up and down the country, all sorts of levels, from right from the top of the top all the way down to, to the lower leagues and non-league to see what they do, how they operate to get the anecdotes and, and the, the real the real stories of how these players have been developed and um, speaking to parents, coaches, mm-hmm. players, administrators. And it's just a real kind of deep exploration of the academy system in this country, uh, the successes and the failures. Why focus specifically on you? Because, I mean, football's so broad and there's, there's so many kind of different avenues you can go down. Why was it youth football in particular that you went down that route of? Well, I think firstly it was because I, I was interested in it. It's something I've always kind of had a fascination. I think like most football fans, um, seeing a young player come through to your club is one of the most exciting things that you, that you can witness. Um, you know, a, a teenage kid coming through and, and mixing it with, with the, uh, the experienced pros. And, and it, there's a real sort of fearlessness that transmits to the crowd as well when you see a, a young player coming in and, and doing their thing and really thriving on the big stage. So I wanted to see how players get to that point, uh, what goes into that journey. Um, all the different ways it can go, the different kind of uh, selection processes they have to jump through and what can go wrong along the way um, mm. and, and just how uncommon that journey is. And then secondly, because it's such a closed off world, um, it's something that, that the average fan doesn't get to see uh, behind those closed doors of the academy. It's something that a lot of clubs are quite secretive of. Um, so I wasn't sure whether it would be, it'd be possible to get the kind of access I needed to make this book. But once I realised that, that I could do that, once that became apparent and once I got in at a few of these academies, I was able to speak to the real kind of decision makers and also the people who were doing the day-to-day work. That's when I realised I really had something that I think could be a really fascinating book. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we're going to focus quite specifically on, on the Arsenal side of things. And I mean, the listeners have actually been asking for a while for kind of more of a focus on Arsenal's youth uh, and looking at some of the issues behind the scenes because Arsenal have gone through a hell of a lot of change um, over the last five years or so with the executives changing, with redundancies being made, and yet still millions and millions of pounds are being spent on, on players that are more of a senior level. And actually, kind of in, in the academies of Arsenal, uh, the way in which the Arsenal Academy has kind of declined, if anything, because, I mean, they just survived relegation from the top tier last season on the final day, I think it was. Um, you've got kind of Per Metazaka now in charge of the academy side of things. But scouts and uh, executive scouts and lead scouts and, I mean, scout and coordinators are being made redundant across the scenes when they, obviously, were due to the pandemic. But which is all part of, of course, that the, what a lot of people around the UK and around the world have had to deal with. But when you put that in tandem with the money that still gets spent after those redundancies are made, it becomes very difficult to try and make an understanding of it. So if we kick off kind of to start with around that focus and then we'll kind of move forward from it. Uh, you said that you spoke for, to, to people that were or had been at the club and were affected majorly by the kind of redundancies that happened. And then they've obviously seen uh, Arsenal then go on and still spend millions and millions of pounds even before the pandemic even happened. So do you want to give some insight into into the listeners about what that situation was? Yeah, so uh, one of the, the interviews I did for this book, um, there, there were probably 100 or more interviews, but, mm. but one of them was with... Uh, uh, a guy who'd recently been a scouting coordinator at Arsenal. I think he spent about four years there. This guy, uh, a guy named Martin Taylor, someone um, I've developed quite a close relationship with. He was at Chelsea mm. for 14 years, then he moved on to Arsenal. And he looked after a small team of youth scouts um, in, in a, a portion of London that they, you know, they divided the, the geography of the, of the country up. Is, they divided up and, and each uh, scout has a patch, essentially, and a, and a coordinator they feed into. 
Um, uh, Martin had been let go. I think it was in 2019. I think I think I'm right in saying, or or maybe slightly before that. Um, it, Arsenal had not long missed out in Champions League, and um, he was told that due to cost cutting measures, he was going to be let go. Um, you know, without the, without the income from the Champions League, they couldn't sustain the, the scouting network that they had. But then within a week or two, um, as I wrote about in the book, um, they broke their transfer record. I think it was, was it around 72 million Pepe, Nicolas Pepe came in. Yeah. So uh, I yeah. think that just kind of illustrates the, the priorities and how um, certain, I, mean, I think a lot of clubs do put a big emphasis on their academy. Um, and they are expensive operations um, and it's difficult to, to get the kind of, the quick returns that I think a lot of people mm. in football, especially the money men in football, like to see. So it's more of a slow burn thing. So when when it's time to pinch the pennies, I think people like the scouts and, and the, the people on the ground in, in, in the youth systems are often seen as quite disposable and not certainly the way he felt. I think that one of the things we've heard from Edu, the technical director, has been that he wants to move to kind of a more data-driven focus on recruitment and on youth as well. Do you think that is... Do you think that's the right way to go about it in the modern day? How how much importance do you think there needs to be on the human element and, and looking at kind of the things that data can't assess, mm. which is character, which is behaviour, which is kind of the, the mindset of players? Do you think that Arsenal are going to lack by by going more to a data-driven route? Yeah, I, I think you have to have a balance. And I think that's what most people within the game mm. would tell you. Um, again, Martin and Scott I spoke, spoke to from the book um, certainly felt that, that his profession – on a wider scale, you know, not, not just to Arsenal, but everywhere, is starting to become marginalised. Um, the experience of the people with their foot, feet on the grass, watching and observing the years and years of, of knowledge accumulated from, from watching football um, was being kind of overlooked in favour of what the spreadsheets were saying. Um, yeah. And, and it's interesting as well because there's kind of that generational gap. A lot of the scouts have been doing it for decades. Um, if they're being asked now to incorporate data into their work, it's not something that a lot of them are comfortable with. But it's just not part of their their expertise. They're, they're, they're from a very different kind of um, makeup in that sense. And they're a very different skill set. It doesn't translate too well to, to learning the, the ins and outs of, of data analytics. So um, it, it ends up being kind of... Um, Two, two rival factions almost in, in, in recruitment, both at youth and senior level mm. from what I gather. So you have those who rely on the kind of very clinical approach of looking at the numbers and um, and analysing what's happening uh, on a football pitch by quantifying it and, and applying a value to it in that sense. But uh, like you say, there are certain things that, that you can't quantify, that you can't put a number on um, and you have to watch and view of your own eyes and, and it helps to have uh, that, that experience of having done it for a long time and having seen hundreds and thousands of hours of football and, and, and to really understand and appreciate what you're seeing to be able to pick up on the small nuances of of the game and, and of character and of, of, of relationships and things like that that can only come through the experience that these people have and, mm. and the, a lot of these people are starting to feel like they're, they're not valued as much as they used to be and that um, you know, recommendations they're making aren't being being uh, picked up upon because it may, maybe the data doesn't back up what they're saying or 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 that uh, more value is being placed now on, on what what is being picked up by the analytics side of things. It, obviously, it, analytics are important. And actually, on the show, we we talk a lot about statistics when breaking down transfer targets, and it is still very difficult from a fan perspective to to know what a player is like behind the scenes beyond their social media profiles, beyond what they're like in interviews, etc. So, the importance on the human element, as you talked about, is just so key and maybe underrated, uh, especially from a fan perspective that doesn't get that same insight. And so, I suppose in the book. Uh, you, being able to give that insight, being able to provide the readers what it's like, and in particular, some of the kind of the tactics that's used by clubs to really get themselves an edge against other sides as well. And specifically for Arsenal, one of the biggest successes they had was, was in the women's game. And previously, Arsenal, of course, were huge. Uh, or they still are huge, of course, but you've seen the likes of Chelsea and Man City and more recently Manchester United as well rise up the ranks and compete with Arsenal and really oust Arsenal from their, from their perch. But... Arsenal were kind of, I suppose, pioneers is the word that you use to describe the way that they trained the, the young girls that were coming through the ranks to help them compete and use some very specific training methods to help do that. Yeah, so uh, again, for the book, I, I met with uh, James Honeyman, who's the Arsenal's female academy manager. Mm. Uh, so he run, runs the operation essentially there. Um, 
and he he was uh, very keen to kind of point out the influence of, of Tessa Payne, who was his predecessor in the role. I think she left a couple of years ago who really helped pioneer some of the methods they use uh, for developing their young uh, young female players, um, specifically with, with, with mixed sex training. Um, so their best girls would be put, put forward to, to train on a regular basis with, with the boys. Um, and they're very careful about how they, how they do that and how they assess what, what each girl is ready for. Um, in terms of the, the kind of the physical side of the game, so mm. uh, you might get a, a, a fourteen-year-old girl who is um, who finds playing with 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 fellow girls at, at her own age not too much of a challenge because of her level of ability. Um, that they'll put her across to, to train with the boys, maybe under twelves or under thirteens, who are that slight, who are kind of more her size, um, but of a of a, of a kind of physicality and a, of a technical level that, that she can. Be stretched by essentially mm. it's working how to get challenges for the best best female players because um the female youth game is still at a level where it's um the the numbers in it aren't aren't as high as, as the men's game it doesn't have the the decades and decades of, of best practices we've seen from all the money that's been pumped into the, the men's side of the academy the the um the experience of the coaches and and um the yeah like you know, the finances dictate everything and there's mm. just more money in the men's youth game just like there is at, at the highest level so at the moment the, the the female game is kind of at a crossroads where it's it's approaching a point where it's gonna it's gonna have to start to make some developments similar to what we saw happen on the men's side of the game um maybe a decade or or so ago and that's what's what one of the really fascinating things i spoke to james about for the book is is how it's going to develop from here um so th- we've already seen that the, the things that arsenal were doing a few years ago being picked up across the board now and then mixed sex training and mixed sex play up to certain age groups is really really popular now it's really common and it's something that arsenal were were leading the way on so they have that tradition of of having one of the most historic uh female um senior teams uh, of, co- of course as we know within football um but it seems that that is, is translated to a pioneering approach um on, on the youth side as well which is really encouraging to see yeah, definitely. It's, it is crazy to think about. I mean, when I was playing youth football, and I know it's at a different level entirely, but how girls and boys are segregated at such an early age. Um, and that in itself, you'd think, like, just separates the quality in itself. Like, the quality of the women's game is improving dramatically all the time. And I think a lot of Arsenal fans have got into watching a lot of the Arsenal games more recently because, of obviously, they're easier access through television rights and stuff like that, and they're really promoting it a lot better in, in the last kind of few years or so. But segregating boys and girls at such a young age is just, in my mind, it's just the wrong way to, to go about things. So the fact that they're now or rather Arsenal have pioneered that system that came in quite a while ago to, to really bring those two sides together and help them to train against one another until the right time to, to specialise is, is such an encouraging kind of thought. I mean, from writing the book and that side of things, did is there anything that came across that, that stuck out to you as kind of things that Arsenal maybe did? And it doesn't have to just relink to the, the women's game, but anything specifically that you saw from an Arsenal perspective that was really kind of a, a standout feature of, of youth production? Yeah, it's, it's certainly that 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 side of things on the female mm. side was was where I went deepest in the book um, as it relates specifically to Arsenal. Um, and yeah, just being ahead of the curve on that was really interesting. It was also interesting to, to, to learn. Um, there are fewer protections for, for clubs um, on the female side um, of the game because um, to give a kind of a brief overview of this, the systems that govern youth football on both the men's and the, and the, and the women's side, uh, there's, there's a uh, a set of rules called the Elite Player Performance Plan um, that govern youth football uh, for boys and, and, and young men um, in in this country in, in the top four divisions, so the Premier League and the Football League. Um, it's, and it's overseen by by the Premier League and the Football League as the authorities. Whereas in in female football, um, there's uh, it's all overseen by the F. Which is what uh, football on the on the boys side was. Uh, up until the late nineties, where they handed power back to the clubs and empowered clubs to to take responsibility for their own um, youth development systems, um, and now with the rise of the Super League, with it with it gaining power, gaining prominence, and, and gaining investment, um, it seems as a, a, a time might come where there'll be a discussion around whether to hand that power back to the clubs and back to the uh, the leagues uh, to, to to govern it rather than the FA. But as things stand, whereas in in the male male side of, side of the game, there's a fixed compensation system. It's quite a controversial thing with a lot of clubs because they, a, a lot of the smaller clubs feel it undervalues their players and that 
that bigger teams can come in and sweep up their best talent and stockpile them. But mm. it does mean at least that, that no matter what happens, they will get compensated for the players that they lose. Um, so it's based on how long uh, they've been training with a certain club and at what level their, their academy is greatest. So the longer you've trained at a high level academy, the, the higher the value is of that player. And that's that's a set fee that a club has to pay to come come and sign them. On the female side, on the in the girls' game, there's no set compensation at all. There's no compensation structure in place. So essentially a team can come along and poach the best player from another team and there's no kind of recourse for, for any kind of compensation for, for the team who are losing that player. So um, while that's great in terms of giving young players the freedom to, to move between clubs, that's something that should be encouraged, I think. Um, just certainly from kind of a, a safeguarding perspective, you know, you don't want to put any barriers uh, to a to a young person to be able to get out of a situation that, that they're not comfortable mm. with or, or to move to somewhere they, they feel will better suit them and, and their development. Um, that's something we've seen on the boys' side where where the compensation system can lead to, to, to boys being trapped at clubs because they want to leave, but they can't find a club willing to pay the, the compensation fee for them. So they're essentially yeah. stuck in limbo. That doesn't happen in the girls' game, but at the same time, it makes clubs reluctant to invest in the development of their young female players for fear of losing them for nothing. And that's something I spoke to James at Arsenal about, um, about yeah. how each club as prestigious as Arsenal as it was such a storied history in, in the girls' and women's game. They still do lose players to, to rivals on a fairly regular basis. So it makes uh, the, the people holding the purse strings reluctant to, to pump investment in to developing these young players who, you know, the, the end goal is, is to reach the first team and play in the WSL. Um, but there's always that risk then that at 14, 15, 16, you, you've put all this effort into creating a, a top young talent that they mm. can be lost elsewhere for nothing. So that's kind of one of the, the things that seems to be holding the girls' game back. And that's something that um, Arsenal are uh, acutely aware of. And, and that's something I spoke to James about. And we, he kind of gave his, his vision for the future in, in that respect. It's it's crazy to me. Like you, you talk about that system there, and there seems to be a lot of benefits of a players being able to obviously move. But for the clubs themselves, you can understand in a sense what maybe why that reluctance is there. But you then reflect upon it and go, well, we need to change something about this because otherwise there is going to be a situation where the clubs aren't going to want to continue to invest in this situation because it is a lot of effort to, to keep developing players to then lose them for nothing. In the men's game, obviously, the finances are skewed way off in the distance in comparison, but it is still so important that we focus on making sure the clubs have an incentive to keep pushing forward with that development. I mean, we've seen it with Man City, I suppose, specifically. They've become such a rich club and the new ownership and to see them also develop by building the academy, bringing up the women's team, Man United now doing it too with their women's team. That is all good. But when you, the stuff you talk about, and I'm sure what you're going to further about in the book that's going on behind the scenes and that really fans aren't too aware of, to be honest, I mean, what you said there is the first time I've ever heard of that kind of, that sort of, kind of information. It's so key that really more people understand the issues facing clubs that are trying to develop women's players and and not being able to necessarily have the same incentives as there is for the men's game to make that same money. I mean, Arsenal just lost Van der Donk to, to Leon, and I know a lot of fan, Arsenal fans were gutted to, to kind of see that go, but no, never anywhere near in kind of the same sense of a financial aspect of, say, Arsenal losing back in the day Van Persie or Fabregas or Nasri. It's, it's, and until kind of those finances kind of even out, I suppose, and if they ever, I can't imagine they will get anywhere close, but as close as they can be to the point where it, it genuinely is more of an incentive so that if you are going to develop a player, when they do leave, there is a financial uh, kind of reward for that rather than what you just talked about there. Um, we are doing the show live, which means we've got plenty of people tuning in and listening as well. So I want to give an opportunity to some people in the chat box to to have an ask of a question. Uh, Arsenal Academy Ultra, very aptly named, says, uh, has Academy Football lost, uh, lost its moral compass? I know innovative academies like Norseland have a no-release clause policy uh, and encourage work within the community. Do you think this could be the future for like, within England and, and other nations too? Um, my my expectation would be that it's gone too far the other way. Uh, as much okay. as it would be great to see something like that, um, it's kind of it's something I I, I spoke about in, in the book. Um, I, I did a chapter on on what I call the the arms race for talent. Um, that's what it's become. All, all these clubs, mm. especially at the top end, the richest academies, are looking to stockpile and and hold on to the best possible talent in, in as big a numbers as they can. Um, 
to kind of come away from that approach and to and to a lot of a lot of coaches that I spoke to would be in favor of not taking players so young into academies because um under E Triple P and under the Charter of Equality, which was the rules that governed governed um English youth football before uh, E Triple P came in twenty twelve. So from the late nineties onwards, um clubs were empowered to sign players from the under nines level upwards. In fact they were they were stipulated that they had to if they wanted to run an academy they had to run an under nines team. Um, as, as their youngest age group so that's the point at which you can you uh, you have to get players to commit to your team exclusively uh, you stop them from training for other clubs at the age of eight uh, and then they become contracted to you for a year at a time um, a lot of uh, coaches like I said and academy directors I spoke to would be in favor of raising that age and to just let yeah. kids be kids up until maybe 10 11 12 and then you bring them in for some more formal training but at the younger ages just let them let them play with their friends let them try different teams let them experience different sports and all kinds of things like that let, let, let them be kids essentially but um the arms race for talent is such that it would take an agreement from all of the top clubs to say okay we're going to do what Bayern Munich have done uh, and stop taking players below the age of 12 but the one club that refuses to do that and wants to book the trend then stands to gain the most because they can go and sweep up all the best talent and get that commitment from them at the earlier age and they, they, they can stockpile they get they get the benefit from it so um i the way i way i described it in the book it, it's like the, the it's called a prisoner's dilemma theory of um uh, it's like an economic theory whereby one person who who uh, reneges on an agreement that you all agree to stands to gain the most so thereby they don't nobody nobody wants to go into that agreement for fear of losing out and that's mm. kind of what it's like in youth football at the moment so whereas in in, in like i said in germany uh, you uh, you see example of Bayern who've stopped taking kids at the younger age groups they're in a unique position where they have a monopoly on that that um that league anyway so they know that they, they can let the best players go to a Leverkusen or a, or a Darmstadt, whoever it might be. Yeah. And three or four years down the line, they're just going to hoover oh, them up man. anyway because they're yeah. buying. That's not the same in English football. You've got at least six clubs at the moment who are very powerful and very competitive for the best young players. They know they can't just go in and hoover up um, talent from elsewhere um, if they agree to not, like, not take them on board. Say, for example, if Arsenal said, OK, we're not going to take any players now until they're 12, um, but that then all the best players start going to Chelsea. They know they've lost those players now. They can't get them. They, they can't go and compete for them down the line. So that's what's holding yeah. holding the system back, and it and it's forcing it to go the other way. Um, so, like um, like the question we had there, uh, it, as much as we'd like to see a more kind of ethical um, approach to youth football, the way things go at the moment, sadly, are pushing it in the opposite direction. Um, yeah, we'd love to see that book, but it's going to take a buy-in from all the powers that be uh, and I think we're a long way off from that at the minute without I want to use the really boring word of Brexit now um so it always comes up as a, a a comedic use in many areas but for youth football in particular it's had a big impact in 2021 because English clubs can no longer sign players uh from the continent uh, of the ages between I think 16 and 18 uh, which obviously means that there is two routes from this. One is that clubs are now looking to find feeder clubs on the continent. You see Manchester City with their City Football Group. They've got a bit across the world where those clubs can buy up young talent, develop them there until they're of age, and then they can come to, to the UK. Um, and the other route is to say that, do you think that this will encourage kind of uh, moral development of players and youth players within the UK rather than there necessarily being as much of an emphasis on trying to bring in exciting talent from abroad? Is, do you think Brexit, no matter what anyone thinks about it as a, as a concept or whatever, is actually going to be a benefit benefit to kind of the the UK British-based youth players across the country? Yeah, there's definitely the potential for that. I think what we've seen over the last few years, I think particularly since Brexit, the, the vote went through and then there was that, mm. that interregnum before it was all ratified. We saw yeah. a lot of clubs going into Europe and, and, and doing the best they can to, to snap up the before the tap is turned off to, to, to kind of get in as yeah. many of these 16-year-old European players as they can. It's something that Man United did a lot of. Um, they seem to be acutely yeah. aware that this opportunity was going to be passing. Yeah, Arsenal did it as well. We it's brought in Joel yeah. Adaho and Salah Radin and uh, oh, there's yeah. a couple of others as well be brought in too so yeah so what they would do do there is even though uh they might bring in 10 players across an 18 month period knowing full well that they'd do well to get one of them through to the first team but at worst mm. they'd be able to make make a good return on, on selling them all elsewhere anyway eventually so it was a money spinner as much as, as anything but what it was also doing i guess is that when you get to that level of uh 16 to 18 um there was an opportunity cost for the players you had before that. Um, so the, the young local players, the young British players you had in your academy from 
from younger ages, um, once they get to that 16, 17, 18 age group, um, the, the, the competition is just rife. Competition for game time mm. is rife. And that's when I, I guess a lot would, would tend to fall away when they come, when it comes time to make decisions on whether to give scholarships to young players. Um, so I guess in theory, only time will tell, but in theory, um, with fewer players coming over from, from Europe um, before the age of 18 now, there will be more opportunities for 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 uh, for British players uh, who are already in the system to to kind of go an extra couple of steps, and they might have other ways done and see what they can do with that. Final question then from the chat box. Uh, Dan Roberts says, "Why do some academies still keep players that they know aren't good enough? For example, uh, Dan actually knows Talaji Bola, who's still who's twenty two and is at the Arsenal academy, never going to get a look in with the first team, um, but he's twenty two. He came through at Hale End. Why do you think these players like Bola are, are still at those big clubs? Um, the kind of sad reality with a lot of the players who are at clubs for a long time and, and never get a sniff towards the first team is that they're there." Is what they call very what well, what has kind of become known very unseemingly as bodies. They're there to just help train the other players. Essentially, you need you need to be able to fill age groups out. Mm. So they hold on to these players, you know, fully aware that they're never going to get a sniff at first team um, uh, training or, or matches because they need there might be one or two prospects in the in the under 18s for example, who do have genuine first team potential. But you need to fill the rest of that team out to be able to give them games. So you have to keep players who aren't quite of that level on your books um, as long as you can to be able to just be able to train with with, with the better players and, and and to be able to give them game time. Um, so yeah, it's something we've we've definitely seen a lot of throughout the game, and it, it is an issue that um, players are coming a long way through the system, spending committing their, their whole kind of young lives to 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 the game and to to progressing through the academy system, but. The reality of the matter is that they're only there to, to prop up the, the more talented players. That's a that's a sad fact that we that we see. That's that's part yeah. of the part of the issue with it. There are you know there are as many as twelve thousand boys in, in the academy system at any one time um, in this country. And um, I think you've seen a lot of clubs now start to move away from the what the, the formalised academy system. Teams like Brentford are now operate in a B team model and what they're yeah. doing is to try and they were criticized for closing down their academy um from a lot of sections because of the heartache it brought to all the players that were part of that academy who were then kind of in footballing terms they were homeless with nowhere to go mm. but what it will do they hope in, in the future and teams like Huddersfield and, and others are following suit is that by having a B team and not having lots of young younger age groups, they're only going to recruit players of 16, 17, 18 years old who they believe have a real chance of making it in their first team. So there will be no bodies, will be no uh, players there just to prop up others. That they, they want to focus on a much smaller number of players, but all, all of those players having a genuine shot at making it in their first team. So that's that again, that's an interesting thing to look at in the future as to whether this current academy system is sustainable. We'll have yeah. to wait and see what success Brentford and others have with their model uh, and whether there'll be more adopters of that in, in, the, in the short term. Well, I was going to ask about that because in my head, when you're saying that, it makes me go, okay, so they're switching to a B team system. Academies, you've got your under 18s, 19s, 20, 21s, 23s, younger than that boys system. That all goes in favour of a B team system. If everyone adopts that, you talk about the over 10,000 young players that are on the books at one time, that's going to catastrophically drop to like 10%, if not lower than that surely the amount of players and, and kids that are kept on the books so if they're only bringing in players as you said there of 16 17 18 years of age how on earth are they ever going to get the grassroots to come through exactly that's the thing if everybody does that now then then the youth football system kind of disappears and, and it, it goes back to i guess it would have re-empowered schools football which is the way it used to be yeah. for for the first kind of century of, of codified football in this country uh, the schools football was the dominant power in youth football and it was only when uh, in the 90s that the charter for quality came in and empowered the clubs that that, that kind of changed but um i think to, it, what, what you would do i think teams like brentford and, and huddersfield and others who who have this b team type model now um perhaps don't appreciate how much they're propped up by the teams who do still run full academies because they're reliant on the players being trained at, at the ages before they get to them so if brentford are only taking players from 17 they're not taking players who've never played football before. They're taking players who've had their training elsewhere and maybe been let yeah. go by another academy or they've bought them from another academy. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 can that system work for everybody? It probably can't. So, again, that's something that um, is going to have to be looked at. If, if, if we're going to say that this current academy system is too flawed to continue in its current state, then um, I think we've also got to say that 
uh, an across the board B team model probably wouldn't work either. So there's got to be some kind of middle ground. The Ryan's book, uh, the link to it is in the description of today's video. Please make sure you give it a look. And uh, I mean, Ryan's going to tell you now, I'm going to put you on the spot now, Ryan, and say, what, why should the listeners really be looking, especially maybe from an Arsenal perspective, but more generally as well, especially with the Euros going on? Why Why is it that should people buy, buy your book? I think if you want to know about how uh, these young stars that we're seeing now on the, in the Euro stage doing so well, um, how they came to be, uh, what, what it looks like to, to develop players like this, and, and the specifics of their stories, because I did get very specific. I, I, you know, I spent time in these academies speaking to the coaches and the players who, and the, and the decision makers who helped develop and put these processes in place. So there's very specific stories about Phil Foden, about Marcus Rashford, about Trent Alexander-Arnold, how they were developed. If you want to know more about that, then it's all in there, but there's also all of the uh, all the downsides too, all the attrition, all the heartbreak that goes along the way that goes into it. It's all part of one one package. You can't have one without the other. It seems mm. so. That f- for me, from from what I, I believe, this is the deepest exploration of academy football in this country that, that's been done. I don't think anyone's had the kind of access I've had before that I was able to get into these academies, into this kind of closed off world, and really really to pull back the curtain and show you show you the, the full picture, what's and all. Um, so yeah, that 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 would that's how I would uh i would sell it and uh, if, if i was going to buy it that's what what i'd be looking for well i mean in 31 minutes of speaking to you ron i've learned about a million things uh, <laughs> so i mean surely an entire book listeners you're going to be able to find out plenty uh, about youth football and especially for the women's and the men's game too and, and finding out about stuff like i mean the brentford system what we spoke about there that's a scary thought if everyone in the uk takes on that model finding out about kind of how the, the biggest talents in football have come about and of course also seeing some of the negative sides to it as well redundancies being made and yet huge amounts of money still being spent on the senior sides too thank you ryan for your time i really appreciate you coming on the channel to have a chat about your book it's been really insightful tell people where they can find you on the socials as well yeah you can find me on twitter at ryan baldy fw um yeah that that's where i'm posting updates all the time about my book that's where i'm shilling my book trying to try <laughs> draw up as many pre-sales it comes out on the 5th of august but you can pre-order now and if it sounds uh, something uh, that, that might interest you please do consider pre-ordering because it really helps there you go. Uh, thanks for having me on, Tom. Cheers. No worries. No problem at all, mate. Link is in the description, people. If you want to go and pre order the book, uh, The Dream Factory, lots of interesting stuff we talked about already. And I hope you've enjoyed the show as well. A little bit of an insight and uh, a sneak peek as to what's been going on there. But we'll be back very soon. I'll be joined by Kevin Campbell this afternoon to talk about Arsenal's transfer situation. We're back again tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. as well for the transfer update show. It's been a pleasure again, Ryan. I'll speak to you guys very, very soon. And as always, up the Arsenal.